Hello, I'm Paul Bradshaw. And I'm Lauren Gray. Welcome to Viral History, the only show on the internet that turns past times into a pastime. Coming up on this week's show, I sit down with humanitarian and writer Terry Waite. We take an exclusive look behind the scenes at the Lawrence of Arabia exhibition, Shifting Sands. And I get some expert local knowledge on my epic hike through history along Pilgrim's Way. First though, some history news. Research by Historic England is shedding new light on the Roman practice of burying treasure. A hoard of eight bronze vessels uncovered in Wiltshire have been found to have been packed with local flowers, perhaps as votive offerings. Archaeologists in Leicester have uncovered a large Roman mosaic in the centre of the city. The site also revealed a possible shrine and evidence of underfloor heating. Further Roman and Iron Age archaeology in Lincolnshire has revealed evidence of an ancient cemetery. The site in Grantham is proving mysterious, but so far quarry pits, kilns and coins have also been identified. I'm Dr. Joanne Paul and you're watching Viral History. Now, he's a tireless humanitarian and campaigner and an established writer. But in 1987, Terry Waite made headlines around the world when he was kidnapped in Beirut and held hostage for five years. Now 25 years on from his release, Viral History had the great pleasure and privilege in talking with him. Terry Waite, thank you so much for joining us on Viral History. Your book is entitled Taken on Trust. How much of your experience as a hostage was about faith and hope and trust. In negotiating with hostage takers, part of my strategy was always to try and have a face-to-face -face meeting with hostage takers. The dangerous strategy, but in many instances it worked. For example, in Iran, in Libya, and uh, to a certain degree in Beirut. But if trust breaks, then you are in, in difficulty. You are in real difficulty. And through no fault of my own, I mean through um, political uh, manipulations, trust was broken in Beirut and I found myself in captivity. But I think trust is fundamental, um, fundamental to peace building. Um, people often say there's nothing we as ordinary people can do to build peace. I don't believe it. Uh, I believe that there can be no political settlement unless there's a basis of trust between people on the ground and we have to be active in building that. You still play a very active role in many organisations. What are some of the things you're involved in these days? Well, uh, many things. First of all, as Hostage UK, when I came out of captivity, I founded an organisation which gives support to hostage families and also disseminates information amongst professionals on a variety of issues that concern uh, hostage taking or hostages. And, and that's developing now into an international organization. We've just set up in America, we're setting up in Italy, and we've been going in, in the UK for a good long time. The second thing, I suppose, is YCARE. Uh, YCARE I founded actually 30 years ago, um, which gives young people all around the world opportunities to develop businesses of their own. You know, if, there are, if young people are left, if there are no opportunities for them, if they have no hope for the future, then they're ripe to join violent gangs and terrorist gangs. And so we're trying to deal with that problem through why care. And thirdly, the principal one, uh, which would be MS for the homeless, which was founded in France, known as a mouse in France, but in this country, MS, founded in France. It's not a religious organization. It's an organization that enables homeless people to come into a community, to leave behind state support, to work according to their capacity, and to get back into life. And I opened the first community in Cambridge about 20 odd years ago. We now have almost 30 in the country and uh, a number more coming along. You were denied almost five years of your life living at liberty and yet you resist bitterness. How do you manage to do that? Well, I think this, I think there's not a soul in this world who doesn't have some suffering in their life. And suffering is no respecter of persons. I mean, some people who led, one might say, a blameless life, they're suddenly affected by tragedy and they suffer deeply. I don't think we can explain really fully what suffering is all about. One thing you can say 
with reasonable degree of certainty, but in the majority of cases, suffering need not destroy. Usually, out of situations of suffering, something creative can emerge. And if you look back in history at some of the great inventions, some of the great creations, they've come when people have suffered. And that's been my philosophy. I'm not going to let, treat those five years as being negative years. I'm going to treat them as years when I was learning a great deal about myself, and now I can apply some of those learnings to help those who are less fortunate than myself. You still do important work for charities and humanitarian organisations. You remain a positive presence. How important is it to turn your experience into a force for good? Well, I think it is important to turn my experience into a force for good um, because I think, and I make no bones about this, someone once said to me, how is it, have you ever thought of why it is you are always trying to work for reconciliation? And I thought about that. Then I realised that when I was trying to work for reconciliation in others, I was also working for my own reconciliation, my own inner reconciliation, to be more of a complete and whole person. And I think in any process like that, when we work for others, we're doing something for ourselves too. And uh, I'm not full of uh, altruism, I do my best. But I know also, I'm not daft, I know also that I'm doing something for myself and I gain immeasurably more from doing that than perhaps I give. What areas of your life did you feel it was most important to write about in your book and how cathartic was that? Well there were several areas I felt I needed to write about when I was writing uh, my, my new book. Um, there were a couple of books on the stocks. I mean first of all the book I wrote in my head in those years when I had no pencil and paper called Take Non Trust is just being issued as a classic edition. It's been in print for 20 odd years and I've written a new chapter for that so to bring it up to date. Another book which is called Out of the Silence, is a book of poetry and uh, um, prose, which actually reflects more the experience uh, subsequent to captivity and the various experiences that I've had. And poetry is a very good way of trying to put concisely something of the emotions and the feelings into a concise way which can be conveyed through, through method of poetry. That will be coming out, Out of the Silence will be coming out later this year. Then I've written something entirely different because I don't think you should lose your sense of humour. And I didn't lose it entirely in captivity. So I've written a book about uh, cruising on the high seas called, um, <laughs> called The Voyage of the Golden Handshake, which is total nonsense. I mean, someone described it as being completely balmy and eccentrically English. Well, I, it is. Not written as a serious book, you mustn't take it too seriously. But it's written, it's a type of thing that I imagined in my head when I was in captivity to make myself laugh. So there are those three books uh, on the stocks and um, the cruising book is out now. Taken on Trust will be out later in the year as will Out of the Silence will be out later in the year. The inspirational Terry Waite. Next, T.E. Lawrence was a British scholar, writer and soldier who mobilised the Arab Revolt during the First World War and became famous as Lawrence of Arabia. Now a new exhibition explores his exploits and his legacy, and Viral History's Laura Cubley went along to find out more. No other name from the Great War has the same mythic status as Lawrence of Arabia. And now, 55 years since the release of David Lean's classic film, this new UK first exhibition hosted at the National Civil War Centre unravels the mystery behind the man. A friend of mine from the T. Lawrence Society uh, approached me with the idea about uh, two years ago. Uh, they'd come back having finished their, their digs in the desert uh, and the original plan was that it was going to go to the Imperial War Museum. Uh, but they then redeveloped their First World War galleries and there was no space for it. So uh, initially he contacted me to see um, if we had any ideas for touring it. Um, but we've managed to do it here and uh, this is a combination of, uh, sort of two years of pulling loans together and uh, getting it all together. During a 10 year investigation in the Jordanian desert, archaeologists have discovered new insights into his story. 
We found the archaeological evidence to support Lawrence's um, accounts. So that's important. It means that Seven Pillars of Wisdom can be regarded as a very reliable war memoir. The second key thing is this. We've shown that the war was on an enormous scale, that the, at the height of the war, the Turks had uh, a post, a fortified post, a garrison post, watching every single part of the railway line along its 800 mile length from Damascus to Medina. So serious was the insurgency, so anxious were they to defend the railway line that it was that level of militarization. Now what that's telling us is there's a huge drain of Ottoman troop strength being tied down in static garrison duty. And once you've got that sense of the impact of the Arab revolt, it's then much easier to understand the relative ease with which the British army broke through under General Allenby in the big conventional campaign that was being fought in Palestine. To really understand the outcome of the war, you've got to think in terms of Arab revolt and British conventional operations side by side and equally important to the downfall of the Ottoman Empire. How did Lawrence deal with his experience? On the one hand, only he could have done what he did. On the other hand, he was a deeply flawed and troubled character. So it's one of those situations in history where the moment calls the man, and then after the moment is gone, the man is gone. One of the pieces on show is an example of the iconic Bruff motorcycle that Lawrence was famous for riding. Harold Wilcox um, is a Newark uh, born man. Uh, he's got two, uh, and he was happy to loan us one of them for the uh, duration of the exhibition. So, Shifting Sands offers a fascinating glimpse into this most elusive of figures, but also an insight into events that have shaped our world today. This is Laura Kubley for Viral History. Such an enigmatic figure. And Shifting Sands, T.E. Lawrence and the Great Arab Revolt will be on at the National Civil War Centre in New York until April 20th. Now, last week I made it as far as the Friary at Aylesford in my epic hike across Kent. Mm -hmm. This week I meet up with an expert and writer on this ancient trackway in part four of Pilgrim's Way. I've spent the night at the Friars at Aylesford, a Carmelite friary dating back to the 13th century and a traditional stopover for pilgrims in the medieval period. I take the opportunity to speak to one of the friars there about the nature of pilgrimage. I think people like a challenge. It is something physically demanding, especially for anyone who actually walks it, whether it be from Winchester to Canterbury or from uh, London to Canterbury, it is physically demanding. But then the, the sense of pilgrimage itself is, is to be found in other world religions as well. And I think people are, it's, for, for many it is more than just a holiday, though people do sometimes take it as a holiday, but this is a very meaningful and significant part of their time. Uh, and, uh, and why do they do it? I think uh, it's more than just they want a challenge. It is leaving the demands of uh, their the home and searching for something. And, and when they come to a holy place, it's, they come to a sacred place and hopefully they can leave something of their concerns, their worries behind and find a deep, deeper meaning to their lives and, uh, and deepening their religious understanding of who God is for them today. Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury, had feuded with his former friend, King Henry II, over the power of the church. And on the 29th of December, 1170, Becket was brutally murdered by four knights inside Canterbury Cathedral. They believed their king, Henry II, had wanted the turbulent Thomas dead. I head southeast and skirt the magnificent Leeds Castle, a quintessential site in England's history since Norman times. 
and a palace favoured by royalty from the time of Edward I until the reign of Henry VIII. Once again, I learn more about this fascinating landscape from Derek Bright. We're looking across from here to the southern edge. We're looking at the southern edge of the North Downs. It's the uh, long chalk escarpment that you can trace from Guildford. And if you follow it east, it will take you all the way to Folkestone and then on to Dover. And it becomes really uh, what we see as the White Cliffs uh, when we reach the channel. For me, this really is what we're looking at, the essence, and it's what the Pilgrim's Way is all about. And it throws up a number of questions. How was this used uh, by travellers over time? It was used by travellers because it's the topography here provides one of the most obvious routes. If you're coming into the country and you're coming from the channel and you're traveling west through to uh, Wiltshire, uh, you know, the Stonehenge area of the country. Below the escarpment, you have uh, claggy clay soils, very hard to walk across. Beyond that, if you go further south, you had the Weald of Kent uh, and Sussex. Described by uh, the Saxons as really an impenetrable forest, it was certainly an area that was very hard to travel through. So if you were, you needed to find a route that offered good drainage and it was firm underfoot. So what we're looking across at is the chalk escarpment at the edge of the downs where we have the chalk ridge embedded with flints. Absolutely fine, dry surface with good firm footing and it's the obvious surface that travellers, prehistoric travellers, would have used if they were crossing the country in a westerly direction. I finish my day satisfied in the knowledge that tomorrow I reach my goal, Canterbury Cathedral. That landscape is just beautiful. Yep, and full of history. A bit like Marguerite. Sixteenth of February. The corset died today, nineteen twenty three, when Coco Chanel, the high priestess of style, showed her new young free collection in Paris. But it came back again quite recently. Well, that's about it from us for this week. Don't forget to follow Viral History on Facebook and Twitter, like this video and subscribe to our channel. And remember, what's past is prologue. See you next week.